today, one of my passions at Fairview and other places is to help people reinvigorate and get interested a little more in the Old Testament. Um, the New Testament's great. I love it. There's nothing wrong with it. But I really like the Old Testament. Deuteronomy, Leviticus, Chronicles are great books. And so when I get a chance to fill in, uh, sometimes I like to throw a little different things at people. So today I want to talk about um, a passage from the book of Second Chronicles. So if you want to get your Bible out and flip through, but I want to set the stage for us a little bit. Um, there's a character who shows up in Second Chronicles who's pretty well known, the man or the king, Solomon. Um, by general show of slight nod of your head, let me know if you've heard the name Solomon before. Okay. I don't want your heads getting too crazy. Um, now Solomon, near the beginning of his rule, there's something really famous that happened. A lot of people know the story of, and that is God showed up and told Solomon what? Anybody want to hazard a quick summary? What did God offer Solomon? We offered him a, a request and the story goes, Solomon asked for wisdom to rule, and God said, well, because you asked for wisdom, I'll give you that and other things. And it's a great story, and we love that story, and it's really fascinating. But that is the end part of a full story. And sometimes we forget the beginning part, what happened to make that conversation occur. And that is what I want to take your attention to today. And to do that, I need to walk us back through a story, a story that unfolds over many pages of Scripture. And it happens, um, it originates earlier, a few chapters back in the, in the Bible, where there is a disgraced former politician who was accused and, well, he actually murdered a man. And so he had been in exile, he ran away, and he was on the top of a mountain. And God appeared to this man in a bush that caught on fire. Of course, we are talking about Moses. Now, God appeared to Moses, his presence, and it was holy. He said, take off your shoes and said, Moses, I have a job for you. I want you to go back to the place where you killed a man, and I want you to lead my people out of Egypt. And he, and he told him there on that mountain by the burning bush, he said, the proof that I'm the one sending you is you are going to come back to this exact same mountain with the whole nation of Israel and worship. And at that point, you will know it was me who actually sent you. So we know Moses went and there was, uh, he did a few miracles and there was the plagues and there was Passover and they came out and eventually they gathered back at that mountain. And Moses went up the mountain to receive the law from God, the Ten Commandments and much of the other law and he wrote it down. But while he was up on the mountain, God gave him instructions for a tent or a tabernacle that he was to build. And he was to put in this tabernacle very specific pieces of furniture. Now one that was really, really fancy was something called the Ark of the Covenant and its lid, the mercy seat. Now that was to be present in the innermost part of the tabernacle, separated from the people, but out near the gates of the tabernacle. So if you think that this is where the Ark is, uh, way back by the door you guys came in, was, was an altar. And the altar was visible from the gate to the tabernacle. When people came, they could see it. And that is where these, most of the offerings were burned. And they could smell and see the effect of what was going on in the altar. Everybody could see that. But nobody could see the ark. And so this, these two men, Bezalel and Ohaliab, great story. I'll do those if pastor asked me to come back sometime. They built all these things and they erected it and... God's presence filled the tabernacle, and from that point on, God's presence at the tabernacle signified his blessing of the people of Israel as they went on their journey, and the ark really became a center and a focus of a demonstration of the power of God. When they crossed the Jordan River, it was the priests carrying the ark. When they stepped into the river, that is when the water stopped, and the ark led the people around the city of Jericho as, and watched the walls fall. And then they set up the tabernacle and all the things in it in a city called Gibeon. And they began from there to go and attack south and then north. And they occupied most all of the nation, the main cities, a lot of them. And 
cleared it out and they began the story of the Old Testament we have in Samuel and Kings and things like that. And while during part of that time, the tabernacle was in Gibeon, but the Israelites were running to a little trouble defeating the Philistines. And they were really, they were losing and they were struggling. They couldn't understand what was going on. They said, you know what we need to do? We need to pull out our, our trump card, our ace uh, in, in the deck, I'm, I'm card terminology. So they went and they said, you know what we do? We're going to get the Ark of the Covenant because God's with the Ark of the Covenant. So if we take the covenant in the battle, we have to win because God can't make us lose if we take the Ark with us. So the Ark, which was supposed to be holy and separated and sanctified, they walked in, they grabbed it. And they walked it into the battle thinking it was going to help them. God said, no. You don't manipulate me and my presence. They lost the battle. The Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant and it went to some Philistine cities. And the, the Israelites lost and they were dejected. And the, the priest, the high priest at the time died. And, and the whole nation got thrown in the turmoil. And the Ark was lost for a little while. Now, God did protect his ark, caused a lot of problems for the Philistines. Eventually, they just, they sent it away on a cart with no person driving it and said, just go away, ark. And the ark dwelled in a man's house for a long, long time until a man came to be king named David. Now, David was interested in trying to restore worship of God and doing what was right. So he went and he went and got the ark and they put it on a cart and they were going to try to take it to Jerusalem. This new city that David had just recently captured. But they didn't really read the instructions for how to treat the Ark of the Covenant. A man died and David got really upset and so it stayed there for a long time. And eventually David figured out what was supposed to do. They got the priests and they took the Ark of the Covenant. But where do you think they took the Ark? Did they take it back to Gibeon where the tabernacle still was? No, he took it to Jerusalem. He made its own tent just for the Ark of the Covenant. So now Jerusalem became where David lived and he built a palace and all these things and he built a tent and he stuck the Ark of the Covenant. So that's Jerusalem. And David rose to power and got wealthy and strong and the, the center of the whole nation be Jerusalem. People were happy and people were excited. But you know where the tabernacle was? It was still in Gibeon. You know what was still in the tabernacle? The altar. See, what had happened was the tabernacle was supposed to be a place to, for the people of Israel to draw near to God. And so at the gate of the tabernacle was this altar where the offerings and the sacrifices were to be made. And once a year, the high priest himself was going to go into the holy place and serve and minister at the Ark of the Covenant. You accessed the Ark through the altar. The ark was not the thing by itself. It was the end result of a full process of humbleness and submitting to God. You don't reach the ark without the altar. The problem now is the ark is way off in Jerusalem. Now turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 1. David dies and he hands things off to his son Solomon. And Solomon, he is, you know, we think of him as the son who takes over, but David had a lot of children, and there was a little bit of political turmoil when David died. It wasn't a smooth transition. And so Solomon actually doesn't start out very overly confident. He actually starts out as a, as a humble man who realizes that there was many other people who had a claim to this throne, but he was chosen. And it's really fascinating what happens here at the beginning of this story. In 2 Chronicles 1, verse 1, it says, Solomon, the son of David, established himself in his kingdom, and the Lord his God was with him and made him exceedingly great. So that's a summary of what's going to happen. Now let's look at the story of why that happened. So verse 2, Solomon spoke to all Israel, to the commanders of thousands, of hundreds, to the judges, to the leaders, and all Israel, and the heads of the father house. So he gets everybody together, all the leaders of the nation, the, the political and the military leaders of the nation, he gathers them all together at Jerusalem and watch what he does in verse 3. And Solomon and all the assembly with him went to the high place 
that was at Gibeon for the tent of meeting of God, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, had made in the wilderness, was there. And notice verse 4, it kind of catches you up on the story. But David had brought the ark from kiriath Jerem to the place David had prepared for it, for he had pitched a tent for it in Jerusalem. So Solomon rises to power in the nation's capital, and he gathers everybody to him. He says, all right, everybody, we're going on a field trip. We are leaving Jerusalem, where the palace is and all of our nice things. We're going into the country a little bit. We're going to go to where the tabernacle is. And you watch what he does then in verse 5. The altar that Bezalel, there's that man I mentioned to you, uh, was there before the tabernacle of the Lord. And Solomon and the assembly resorted to it. And Solomon went up there to the bronze altar before the Lord and offered a thousand burnt offerings on it. See, in Jerusalem was the ark. You didn't offer sacrifices on the ark. That was the, the place where God's presence was intended to dwell. But the reason it was in Jerusalem is not because God had it moved there, but because one time in the past, the nation of Israel had thought they could manipulate God's presence by taking him with them. They had separated the ark from the altar. So when Solomon comes to power, he gets everyone together and they return to the altar. And they offer a thousand burnt offerings onto it. Who here's ever butchered a goat for a holiday or something? One goat. Takes a while, right? Can you imagine doing a thousand and then burning them all together? It's a big, it would have been a big deal, right? We have a lot of people here gathered. But that is what Solomon did. And why I think it's powerful is then verse 7, in that night, God appeared to Solomon. See, the thing is, we remember the story of God appearing to Solomon saying, I will grant you a request. And Solomon asked for wisdom and, and God said, I'm going to give you everything. That's a wonderful story. We love it. And it's a good reminder to seek out wisdom and not wealth and all these other things. But the thing is, that is merely the culmination of a story that demonstrated Solomon had a heart that was unique and different. And what that was represented by was the humility and the understanding to return to the altar. See, what had happened was Jerusalem had become the center. David had captured it. He had milled his palace there. He had moved the ark there. And he had built his own tent for the ark. David had built it, not, you know, God's direction. And so it had sat there. And it had become, now Jerusalem had become the center of politics and focus and wealth and privilege. And all of that was gathered there. And when Solomon came to power, he could have continued to, to lead from Jerusalem to say, this is where our capital is. But he understood that because the people had ripped the ark out of the tabernacle, where was God's presence probably still located? In Gibeon with the tabernacle. Because the altar was how people approached God. So Solomon sought the altar. And it was that night that God appeared to him. He said, Solomon, I want to give you something. Solomon had sought the presence of God. And so now God was ready to commune and fellowship with him. And we start now this rule with that humble asking for wisdom and the realization that Solomon is making that his success, his achievement, what he's going to become as a leader requires his humility to leave the wealth and the privilege and the appearance of religion and to seek out the altar. And the reason I, I can say this is unique is because this story is told a little bit differently in the book of First Kings. Uh, it has a little bit different focus, but if you flip to First Kings, this is the, the same idea, the ending of David's rule. There is another character who goes back to the altar. See, while David was in charge, he had a general... Who, anybody know Gen, uh, David's general name? I don't have any candy to give out, so I probably shouldn't ask. Uh, his name was Joab. 
Now, Joab got to be David's general by taking over Jerusalem. David said, whoever conquers Jerusalem will become my general. Joab helped lead the charge, took over Jerusalem, and became David's general. Now, Joab's a fascinating character. I encourage you to study him as well. But Joab is a man driven by his fleshly wisdom and his own desires. And he serves and seeks the political power. So when David sends out says, hey, I need you to kill a guy, Joab says, no problem, I'll kill a guy. When David was doing things Joab didn't agree with, Joab tried to work around this behind the scenes to make things work out the way he wanted to. But what happened is, is when Solomon took over, Joab, um, Joab had kind of aligned himself with a different son of David. Uh, he didn't think Solomon was, would make a good king. And so what happens is when Solomon does become king, second, or 1 Kings 2, verse 28, it says, When the news came to Joab, for Joab had supported Adonijah, it tells us Joab fled to the tent of the Lord and caught hold of the horns of the altar. And we're going to find out that Solomon sends his general, and he, the general comes and says, Joab, come, come out of the tabernacle. Joab's like, no, 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 no. If you want to kill me, you're going to have to come in here. Where was Joab? Clinging to the altar. You say, well, he sought out the altar too. But he doesn't do something, right? He runs to the altar for fear of his life. He runs to the altar and does not offer a sacrifice. He himself clings to the horns of the altar and tries to find protection and doesn't think that Solomon will send somebody into the tabernacle to kill him because he's right there by the altar. But Solomon tells his general, go in and kill him. And he dies there by the altar. See, what happened is we have two different people who had these places of privilege at the end of David's rule. His son Solomon who'd be king and his general Joab. Joab ran to the altar to try to protect his life. Once again, we see a person trying to manipulate the appearance of religion for personal benefit. And instead of offering a sacrifice on the altar, guess whose blood is spilt on the side of the altar? His own. He ended up offering himself as an offering. And God judged him accordingly and said, all right. If you're not going to offer an offering to me, your own blood will be spilled on this altar, and thus that will end your life. Solomon, on the other hand, went and gathered all the leaders and went to the altar and offered a thousand burnt offerings on it. Two men, two people who had power, two people who couldn't control their destiny, one of them sought out God's presence for personal benefit. One of them sought it out out of abject humility. Guess who God appeared to? Solomon. See, the, sometimes in the Old Testament, we think about these offerings and the killing the animals, and, and it, it, it kind of doesn't ring with us. It's not something we're familiar with. It doesn't make a lot of sense. But the whole point of the whole process, from the gate to the altar to the ark, was to offer a way for people to draw near to the presence of God. Ever since mankind was separated from God in the Garden of Eden, God has desired for humans to build and to have a relationship with Him, but we're separated from God because of our sinful lives and our evil hearts that seek our own way. And so God at various times has instituted a way for people to approach Him. So He made this tabernacle. And if you look in the book of Leviticus, um, I know you probably won't, but if you do, and you look through all the, the, the killing of the animal directions in Leviticus, you don't see the word sacrifice used very often. It's the word offering, which in Hebrew means to draw near. That's why in Hebrews, the author who loves the Old Testament says, let us what? Draw near. And if you flip to Isaiah 29... When the nation is falling apart and isn't going very well, in Isaiah 29, we have God tell Isaiah this in verse 13. He said, the Lord said, because this people draw near, what? 
with their mouth and honor me with their lips. But their hearts are far from me and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. There's that word draw near, same Hebrew word for offering. See, God is saying people are trying to come close and trying to pretend like they want to be with me with their mouth. But their heart is in Jerusalem. And, and we do this sometimes, right? Um, we, we say things we don't mean sometimes, right? Who here has ever done that? Either we tell someone, it's good to see you. but well, we don't actually think that. Or, or maybe, um, maybe you've been like me. You say, I, I need to exercise. I need, I need to lose a little bit of weight, right? But do I make any action choices to change that? No. Um, or um, I, tell, I tell somebody, yeah, you know, I, I need to get back to reading a few more books. You know, it's a good habit to have read books. But that night, when I have a little downtime, what do I do? I flick the TV on and watch a show. Right? It's easy to say things we want to do, but to make a choices requires that our hearts are actually committed to something. Uh, for example, you know, back in March when people started getting instructions on how to protect themselves, there was one thing out there called uh, that people said, don't touch your face. Remember that? We don't hear it as much anymore. It's not that it's not true. It's just, you know. Now, early on, who here had trouble not touching their face? Anybody? You probably never thought about how much you touched your face, right? And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, no, I, I, I got to touch my face. Oh, I can't touch my face. It takes a while to build those habits. But if you know that it's important enough to not touch your face, what will you do? You'll work at it. You'll try to figure out a way to not touch your face. I told someone, I said, just rub some scotch bonnet peppers on your fingers. You just won't touch your face. Don't worry. I used to work in a virus research lab. And um, I worked with, well, I won't tell you everything I worked with. Ask me afterwards. But working in that lab, I had to change into different clothes. I had to wear uh, all sorts of different protective equipment. And you know what I learned very quickly not to do? Touch my face. I just developed it as a habit and I built it in. And so when all this happened, I said, oh, yeah, you don't touch your face. I didn't realize that a lot of people hadn't developed that habit in their life. But I had to because there was a very significant reason. The health of me and my whole family depended on me, what? Not touching my face. The importance of something was reflected in my choices. Solomon reflected his heart attitude by the choice that he made. The Ark of the Covenant was there. The palace was there. His dad had captured the city and ruled from there. It would have been easy to resume the rule and said, you know, I'm the king. The priests do the temple stuff. That's not really my job. I, I'll do the ruling stuff. That can stay there if I hear. Otherwise, we'll change something. But no, Solomon recognized that there was a difference between the appearance of religion, having the ark nearby, and actually seeking the presence of God. And what we have to realize as we read this story uh, of Chronicles and we watch Solomon do that, is we love the idea of God appearing to us and asking us a request, right? That sounds really awesome. If God tonight showed up to any of us and said, I will grant you a request, we would have a testimony to tell next Sunday, wouldn't we? But the thing is, we need to be committed to the humility that Solomon had at the beginning of the story. We have to understand that the presence of God is not the end result, or not the beginning, but the end result of a heart that is committed to what the altar represented. So when people had to offer a sacrifice, you had to come to the gate you had to put your hand on top of the animal you were offering, and you yourself had to then kill that animal and then hand it to the priest. And while you stood in the gate and you killed that animal, you could see the altar. It was a big old piece of furniture. You knew what you were doing and why you were doing it. It was great to think about the presence of God in the ark back in the back of the tabernacle, but you did not get there unless you went through the altar. 
See, for us, it's easy sometimes in a nation like ours to carry with us the appearance of religion. It is easy for us to act like we were in Jerusalem and we have the ark nearby. It's easy to act like that because from an early age, we learn the same songs, right? We learn uh, all these courses and we do devotions in school and we have the opportunity to learn. And so the appearance of religion is easy. It's pretty commonplace. It's not looked down upon by a wide majority of people yet. And so it's easy to come to church and to act like it. But the question is, is our hearts committed with our actions to seek out God's presence, to actually pursue the altar? You say, what does it mean for me to pursue the altar? Because I'm not actually supposed to offer sacrifices. Well, let, let's talk about it. It's easy to bring this book to church on Sunday and to open it. There's a lot of people have it, right? And the pastor makes you read stuff in it, um, and he wants you to look at it, and he's showing you things. And you are making the appearance and the demonstration that you say this is important. What are you going to do with this book tomorrow? When nobody's watching you in the morning or the evening, what are you going to do? See, our, our commitments and our heart attitudes are not measured by the things that are easy but by what we do that is more difficult. And so this book is a simple measure in a test of that. You know, already in this message, I've given you about three different other things you could go read and study on your own. Anybody catch them? Or did they kind of slide by you? I said, hunt down this Bezalel guy who shows up a few times. Or go read about this Joab guy. If I were to give a quiz right now on some of these characters, who here are confident you'd get a passing grade on the character Joab. Anybody? Anybody about Bezalel? Good? See, you could tomorrow go and pursue a week. Say, let me go find out more about this guy. And that sort of passion and desire to say, you know what, there's more I can learn. There's more I can seek out. There's, there's more maybe I don't know and, and pursue that. That is the action, that's taking a choice of your own to pursue the presence of God by giving up of your time and seeking out God. It sounds little, it sounds simple, but you know what's going to happen tomorrow morning? You wake up, and it's Monday, so you wake up a little late, right? And what, anyone here have a busy schedule Monday? Anybody? You're already, you're already thinking about the things you have to do tomorrow. Anybody? Right, if you open my phone right now, I have a to-do list app, and there's already a Monday list on there, right? Starting to fill it up. It's like, oh, you know, I got to do that Monday, I got to do that Monday. When I wake up tomorrow morning, you know what's going to be easy for me to do? And I don't want to let this stuff sit. I'm going to get right to working. And that's the same idea what Solomon did. He became king. He got all the leaders together. You know there's a lot to deal with. People weren't happy about him ruling. He's got to deal with some things. He's got to set the course of the nation. There's a lot to do. He could have turned his attention to leading and being a good leader, and that would have been perfectly fine in the eyes of the world. And if you wake up tomorrow and you know you have to take responsibility for your kids or your wife or your family or your relatives or your work and you have things to do, and that's great. You need to work hard. You need to be productive. But Solomon stopped, gathered everybody together, so we're going to seek the presence of God. What we need to do in our lives is if we like the idea of what Solomon got from God, we also need to like the idea of what Solomon did for God. Solomon stopped his life and went to the altar. We as people, if we like the idea of what God does, but we detest the idea of of personal sacrifice, it will never come together. Joab died at the altar because he thought God was only there when he needed him. Solomon received wealth and wisdom from God because Solomon said, I need to be with God all the time so when I need him, he's right there. That is the attitude you and I need to carry in our life. 
if we say we value who God is, we must demonstrate that with our choices. It's really, it's really cool. You guys, when you started, I had to write this down. Let me find it. Um, you guys started, and the, the song leader t had us turn to Psalm 27. And it was really fascinating that that passage perfectly summarized what I was about to talk about. And it starts here in Psalm 27. He says, there's evildoers assailing me, my adversaries, my foes, and armies encamped against me. He needed help. But right there in Psalm 27... One thing I've asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. For he will hide me in his shelter. He will conceal me under the cover of what? His tent. David recognized, and thus he taught his son, that the presence, the help, the satisfaction of God did not begin at the empty ark, but it began at an empty altar. And putting upon that our lives and our commitments to serve God at our cost so that we could benefit from God's love. We don't get to the ark without the altar. And you and I must live our lives if we desire and say we want to be a Christian and serve God. We are going to have to turn our lives our hearts, our minds, to doing altar-type activities in our life. So thank you for letting me be here today. I hope that that idea challenges you to rethink and to recommit to making choices to put your life on the altar for God and to serve Him. Big things are great, but start with the little things. Start with turning to His Word or prayer or seeking Him out in those ways. And you will then benefit from the presence of God. I will close in prayer and turn it over to whoever wraps up. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the chance to sing these songs and to lift our voices and to clap our hands and to do these amazing things. But Father, we need help. We need your spirit to strengthen us, to be humble people, to recognize that the appearance of what we do must come from a heart that's truly committed to being humble and to seeking you out. Father, we want your presence. So help us to give and to sacrifice and to offer to you our lives for that presence. Lord, help everyone sitting here to consider and to measure their life and whether they are like Joab and trying to cling to God for personal benefit. Father, help us all to consider how we can be like Solomon and to return to the altar and look to you for help and dependency so you may bless us and encourage us and carry us through this week. Uh, may we reflect you by our heart, attitude, and choices. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, thank Reverend Gibbs for that. Um, what a challenge. Simple, but powerful challenge. You don't get to God's presence if you don't go through the altar. Wow. Simple, but powerful Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. If you want God's presence, there has to be some altar work. Wow. I'm inviting you to, before you stand, I'm going to ask you to just bow your heads, close your eyes. I don't want anybody um, looking around. My question is for those who do not know the Lord as their Savior. If you want God's presence in your life, if you desire 
to have a relationship with God, you have to go through Jesus Christ. That's how it works. It's not about having Jesus with you when you need him. It's having him with you all the time. It's not about asking God to show up when you need him. It's the fact that he's there all the time. Because you're making that sacrifice. You're, you're doing that sacrificial service. And if you're here and you're not saved, and you know it, you have never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. I'm not talking about being baptized. I'm not talking about going to church. I'm not talking about growing up in a Christian family. I'm talking about have you given your life to Jesus? Have you made that commitment that God, you are my Lord. Have you submitted and surrendered your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? Have you done that? I'm not talking about being a member of a church. Have you done that? We're going to sing shortly. And if you have not trusted Jesus Christ and you want to do so, I'm going to ask you as, you, as we sing to step forward, and somebody can take you and show you from the word of God how you can be saved. If you're here and you are a Christian, you are a believer, the charge is simple. It is, it is powerful. If you want the presence of God in your life, you have to go through the altar. That's it. It's so simple, but yet powerful. And I love it. You can't have one without the other. So we're going to sing this morning and... Uh, if that is your desire, as we sing, step forward. If you know within your heart of hearts that you, you haven't been doing the sacrificial part, but you want the presence of God, and you want to change that, as we sing, sing step out and make that commitment. Let me invite you to stand with me, and we're going to sing, This is my desire. To honor you. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul.
All we present in our bodies is a living sacrifice daily. It is so true that even though because of COVID, a lot of us have been shut in, certain things have been shut down. The truth is we still find ways to keep busy. And are we spending that time that we need? Are we, are we making that commitment that we need? To, are we putting action to our words? I don't want to come to church every Sunday and just have a good time and not allow the word of God and the spirit of God to work in my life and change my heart. I want to change. I want to be more like Christ. Here's the thing. Having desire alone and not putting patience to it doesn't work. action to what was said. Let's sing that song one more time. And as you sing it, if you mean it, sing it. And here's the challenge. If you don't mean it, don't sing it. Thank you this morning for your word. How simple and straightforward, yet so powerful. God, so many times we we miss the fact that being in a relationship with you means that we have a part to play. That we have some responsibilities to perform. We have some things that we need to do. And God, it is true that we are so guilty of, at, at times for wanting you to do what only you can do and not want to do what we're supposed to do. And then God, when you don't do what we want you to do, we, we get upset and say, you're not real, you're not working. When the problem is never with you, God, the problem is always with us. So God, help us to daily look into the mirror of your word and to see ourselves for who we truly are and what we need to do and what we need to change and actively be involved in doing what you have called us to do. God, we thank you for working in our lives today. God, help us to leave this place living out this week differently, not the same. With the understanding, oh God, 
that to get to your presence, we have to go through the altar. We thank you, God, for your word. You said it will not return unto you void, but accomplish that which you please. I pray for those, oh God, that you're, who you're working in right now, that God, whatever the, the desire is, whatever they're asking, oh God. Pray for the sister that has stepped forward, that God, you will move in her life. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ that every wall will be torn down. That God, she will walk out of this room with a changed mindset. Will be with being somebody different, somebody new because of meeting with you. That God, she will never be the same again. That God, she will never return. That she will close that door. God, help us to live up to our responsibilities, God. When it comes to our relationship with you. We ask you to have your way in our life. We ask you, God, to touch each and every person in this room. God, help us to leave and refuse to be the same. That we will not leave the same way we came in, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We invite you to say the benediction with me as we leave my encouragement to you to is to go and put what you have heard into practice this gathering may be we'll dismiss this gathering in a few minutes but your walk with god is never dismissed yeah. <laughs> it's a constant thing Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Son and Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you again. Go forth and live the word of God. <laughs>